questions that they're kind of holding on to that haven't yet been had a chance to be raised. But I want to bring in Kat to respond to that, to that positioning of a bank that's sponsoring maker spaces that mm -hmm. believes in maker spaces as something that can add value to them. Can you unpack that? Like what's the value, what's the trade-off, what's the anti-politic around that? No pressure. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, it's interesting that I, I've heard of this initiative, but I guess my question is like a, a, being a bit more critical is in this sort of partnership. But when I was at Mozilla, for example, we did a big partnership with Telefonica to try to release a bunch of web literacy tools. And they, so they gave us a lot of funding to do this. And everyone was really excited. <coughs> and uh, about two years in, the whole thing failed. Um, and I think it was because we lost a lot of our makers and our open technology advocates along the way because they felt like Telefonica took over too much and their their motiv their motivation that I was talking about was very strong but ours was not as strong and so we got crushed in a way because they were the bigger yeah. manager. So, so I, I guess in this case, what what is the motive yeah. of the bank? So that's yeah, yeah, no, that's an interesting question. I, I got completely um, had a whole different different speech, completely prepared up here, completely changed from. Um, so I'll probably not explain it very well. Um, probably should have said I'm the head of engineers for all the maker spaces, so I look after all of them up and down the country. Um, and how, what is it for bikers and why are we doing it and why are we doing it differently? So Eagle Labs, again, isn't just a maker space, it's also incubators and it's also hot desk and all the things for startups. And if a bank was trying to do it through normal means, if it was trying to approach businesses and, and work with people through its normal operating thing of come to a ranch, Come to um, you know, come to this stuffy office and speak to us about very businessy things. That's not the way everyone works. That's not the way startups work. And if you just expect them to come to you, it's never going to happen. You have to work at the completely grassroots levels. That's why we have seventeen labs that aren't branches. Some of them are actually turned from old branches, but they're completely renovated into these beautiful spaces, handled. Um, and it means we can interact with people and speak with people and, uh, and build up relationships from the ground up. So they trust us, we use our network of partners and contacts, and usually they're just, um, my colleague of Project to Leave, and she was gonna help me with the presentation, share. She works in Avenue HQ, which is down in the docks, um, and she works with residents there, she works with Avenue HQ, she works with all the people in the area that start connecting people. Because we're a bank, we have loads of networks, we have loads of contacts that ordinarily would get just Going out, we'll go, we'll go anywhere. But through Eagle Labs, we can, our mandate is to support, you know, support the UK economy, support UK business growth from one man, one band, whether in SME. The mandate is to support and foster innovation in the UK and how, many, how we want to wrap it in a buzzword. Um, that's why we're doing it from the grassroots level. Like if the UK prospers, Barclays prospers. And I, my background is product design, industrial design, making, and all sorts of things. So my, the reason why I get out of bed and work for a bank is because. I believe they're trying to do the right thing. And it is about allowing, it's the journey they've gone through as a bank about living out of technology and the impacts of things like the Digital Eagle program or the Life Skills program, teaching kids, teaching elderly about coding and things. Why can't we take that ethos but also apply that to business? So you've got three elements then, really. So well, you yes, you kind of. Kind of <coughs> yeah. Educating the bank about what the economy now looks like, yeah. and feels like how it's experienced mm. by everyday people on the yeah. You've got that kind of investing in the UK as... You can't, yeah, yeah. And the UK economy to support startups and to support yeah, communities yeah. and similar. And to do that you need, again, what I'm trying to do, that's just that takes partnership. Uh -huh. We can't do that ourselves, but we know if, if we put ourselves in the right locations and work with the right people, we can help the UK to prosper. And then somewhere in there, you've got to have access to capital and selling people backing products, surely. Yeah. Yeah, but that's not my job. Oh, that's good. My, my, my job is to empower a, uh, a group of makers to support business and support communities, community initiatives. One example is we've worked with a, um, in Brighton again, uh, there's a charity called Martlets, which is like a, they have, a bit like Superland Bananas with snails. It's a charity, and we've helped them, um, uh, yeah. So it's, you know, like a big, um, yeah. like, like big fiberglass snails on the city. Um, we've helped them fit those machines with um, a lot of tech, uh, and also able to take contactless payments, um, and all sorts of things like that. Okay. So, yeah. Cool. Okay. So, 
very quickly, what's Parker's measure of success with this? It's the sort of fit the maker space side out of it. Um, then no, measure. No, you need to leave that in. That's oh, sorry, yeah. So <laughs> our, our, our success, you know, that's what I'm. That's why I've been brought in to help figure that out. I believe it's how we can support, to fit the middle ground of SMEs and startups, how many, no sorry, to take the, um, the three chunks of kind of the people we work with, communities and schools, um, startups and SMEs and entrepreneurs and corporates, um, as makers, how can we have an impact on those three, those three areas, whether that's education, empowerment, adoption of technology, um, and one example of that is we helped uh, what they called? Uh, Salford Royal. We helped them adopt 3D printing. They had it already, but we helped them adopt it in a different way, which has ended using our engineers through a process of workshops and all sorts of relationships. They've now saved a life because of the things we've helped them understand. That's a measure of success. Because we've helped them adopt technology in a way that supported and saved a life. That's one area. Another area is um, working with a corporate and help them understand the technology from a major point of view and the mentality around it, the methodology, they then to go and adopt it. And then that's my point of view from how I think makers had it. And then the bank will take over everything else. That's not what I'm interested in. Um, yeah, I think the question from Doug is getting as well is uh, how do you stop Bob is taking out back on Tuesday when the lease is running out or in five years when they say it wasn't a success? How do you stop that? Because that sounds like that very much is your job. Yeah, I guess. As, as you understand it, the meme I heard, which might come be kind of bullshit, yeah. is that this, this started with some corporate social responsibility or penance from libel, <laughs> and then it, it had the hell boots and evil apps, which again, you can't answer that. No, I can't, because I was in But how do you stop them yeah. in kind of a few years? <laughs> like everything else? Yeah, I think it's. I don't know if I can give that a straight answer, but what I can okay. say. Well, what I can, again. Can you talk around Yeah, I, I, I can talk about it. I think that, that what they. the lengths they're going to. to Make it stick. So by the end of so in two years we're going to have twenty five sites, yep. and the energy and the energy of how it's changing the bank is and the and how it's changing how it operates the culture is changing, helping yeah. staff internally adopt and change how we work, going from this rigid corporate world which scares the hell out of me at the same time. Um, the time and effort and energy they're trying to make this work. That's why I, the make space didn't have a. The group of engineers and like makers and creators didn't have a voice. I've been brought in to try and give them a voice and be part of that journey. I don't think I would have been brought in if they weren't invested in making it happen and making it stick. So, probably not a direct answer, I apologise, but as a gesture, so to speak, I don't think they'd put as much effort in it if they didn't believe in it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alex? James? Um, um, yeah. Firstly, I'd love to, I, I want to thank you for um, supporting today because that's one of the things that you are doing as part of this. Yeah. So, um, what I'd like to ask you is a kind of, in a sense, historical question that links to what Kat is presenting. Um, I always think of the watershed moment in the UK with respect to what we're all talking about is, um, uh, I've forgotten his uh, first name now, but um, the former CEO of Google coming to Scotland to talk about coding and how terrible England and the UK was at coding. And I feel like that was a moment in which a whole bunch of people who never would have cared about any of what's happening suddenly were like, what's, what are we talking about? And suddenly got interested. And do you feel that the bank, you know, had it not been for that, um, those kinds of people yeah. um, coming in from America predominantly and kind of saying, you too can build a Silicon Valley environment. Do you think that they would have been as interested as quickly in relative terms? I don't know if it's a direct response from specific people or trends. I think the bigger trend is technology. I think that was where things like the digital legal program and life skills started, was around people understanding and adopting new skills and technology. I think that's where, and that probably was a byproduct of those kind of people coming in and, and spreading awareness of what that technology could do and then everyone jumps on board. And I think that was definitely part of it. I think, um, what was the example I was going to use? Um, yeah, I think that's where it all stemmed from is that 
Ah, no, what it stemmed from was that um, some other bright ideas put iPads in, in branches. Um, I can't remember the story, but every time I had a bright idea, but let's, you know, let's use technology to improve things and make life easier. But they gave iPads to all people, and branches had been there for all, their entire lives, had no idea. But the younger generation did. So I think at one point, some silly thing they had, but so many iPads, but no, none of them had been used. So they set up programs to then use the younger, younger uh, employees to educate the older employees. And that's where a lot of this stems from. Is well, why that's happening in the UK? And we want to use technology to help people and all sorts of things and bank and whatever. But there must be obviously a lot of society doing the same thing. So maybe not a direct result of people, but definitely a direct result of changing times. Um, and that's where a lot of things stem from. Is well. If that's happening just for us in fact, well, you know, thousands of people in the branch that must be happening in the UK. So why, what can we, as we've gone through that journey, and again, I say we have only six months, but how can we, how can that, we then support the UK in that journey of education, adoption, and so on? So, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. I mean, just, just yeah. really quick, I, I do think that it's really interesting, and many of you guys have mentioned this today, that like we are in this cultural moment both in the UK but also globally, where making is becoming more and more understood by more and more people. I wouldn't say mainstream yet, but like it, it's becoming a term in different languages that different cultures are interpreting in their own ways. Um, I, Hannah actually submitted a piece to a, a journal article that we did as part of the journal of peer production, um, like a special issue, and there are about 20 different pieces, all of them are open source, I can share them with you about how maker culture is becoming institutionalized all around the world. So there's a bunch of different case studies from makers and academics who have written about this, and we got so many entries about this topic from all over the world. So it's interesting that it's, it's not only in the UK, but it's it's everywhere. That banks, yeah. that schools, that museums, that you know, there, there are a million different ways that like corporate social responsibility programs are now coming, uh, filtering down into our work. And I think there's a lot of opportunities there. There's a lot of um, issues, but also a lot of yeah. um, exciting case studies coming mm -hmm. out of that. Institutionalization isn't always this top-down kind of process. It's mm -hmm. also about co-institutionalization, where the bottom up is informing and changing and re-leveraging. And that's, that's, what we feel like, that's what we feel like as a group of makers who have these spaces in the bank is that we're doing that from the bottom up, and we are starting to say that is, this is a, a way of being and a way of conducting yourself is massively important to society, not just to business. Like how we will operate in the future is like again, because of this weird but brilliant thing, I think, and that's why I took this as a job and not set up a leather company using 3D printers to make things. Um, as a, having that reach and that power potentially could be good. Yeah. We're still a long way to go in that. And well, also you're wearing quite an awkward hat. Oh, I've right As that. a hacky startup. Working with Barclays, yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent branches doing it. Yeah, yeah, it, it's, it's a, a very, very strange tightrope to walk that That's is right. misunderstood. Jay. Um, yeah, Paul, um, I've got a, I'm interested in the kind of um, the dynamics of the economy. Um, you, you sell stuff to, to uh, lots of people in this world. Like, what, what do you think, what are the main drivers that book take and for starting out as you see it, and how has that changed over time? So in terms of kind of uptake, how do you... So like, where do people start? What are they starting with? How are they getting involved, involved yeah. in it? Always blinking lights, how do you use Okay, <laughs> they always start there. Yeah. Pretty much. And how they, how, what's the journey? What's the what's journey like? And, you know, how have you, how have you seen that change over time? I think uh, the, the only people you follow are the people who kind of stick their head above the battlements and make YouTube videos or share it a lot. So that's very kind of self-selecting about who you see in their journey. Um, then they kind of meld it with whatever they're interested in. Um, I think it's getting more, it's, it's kind of getting a beautiful mashup at the moment where it's, it's kind of fashion or a particular thing, wearables, 3D printing. They're all people are just starting to collide in ways where they realize they don't need permission to abuse a 3D printer because they can fix it, right? Because 3D printers always need fixing. So, in principle, fabric's currently blowing up 3D printing. You, put, you do a layer of 3D printing, a couple of layers thick, put some fabric down, and carry on printing. That's currently going. Which is amazing. Um, it's now democratised. Um, so yeah, people start with blinky lights and then go off with what they love, which is great. Or well, they start a lot of the time, but maybe the third or fourth time they come back, they'll click and say, right, this is why I need it, rather than just because they think they should. You had a question? Yeah, I was just curious from from Ezekiel Robinson. Um, and 
Um, you talk a lot there about the educational benefits of from going to schools and doing that. I'm curious to know exactly how they're actually yeah. going in and implementing that in schools in a really meaningful way, and whether this is something that you go in to a place to do something in branding, or whether there's a pedagogical practice on side. So a lot of how it's happened before has very much been driven by the engine themselves. So it's very different depending on location, the person, and how they came into being in that space. Some, so one, one for example, one of the engineers we have who's through and through a maker at heart used to be an ex-head teacher. So it brings over a lot of understanding of what, how schools run, the politics, the money, um, and she's managed to balance that line by doing regular, because we have a mandate to do stuff for the community, not just not as a tokenistic thing. So she, she has gone in and run um, either a, a summer thing or a monthly thing. That's the relationship she's built up with that school. Some schools I'm not able to get into for whatever reason because it's something to do with it. I think it's in Cardiff, we couldn't get in. And again, there's there no strings attacks. And then others have done similar things with another country, depending on who they've known. So it's very much been the, the, um, in the hands of the engineer, borrowing on things like code. There's a thing called beautiful code, code playground. Um, and we're now starting to think about how do we do that properly, not just there. So do you have a, a teacher or educators on board? In no, certain moments, important. Say again, sorry. Like teachers and educators that are employed in that. Yes, we have. A, uh, there's a guy who does the local stuff. He's got does the co playground stuff for here. A guy called uh, Keith or Kevin, and he is employed to do to run these sessions as part of these. Not as okay, I swear it's getting blurry, but Eagle Labs or digital skills or. And he runs sessions. His job is to go around, go around in this local area. I forgot how where the boundary is. And to run sessions for kids, and we use BBC micro bits and a variety of bits and bobs, and take 3D printers and run a little course and um, do things. Yeah. It's just the only reason I'm going to say this, I'm sure not chipping right now, is because um, obviously we go through research and go through and go through the mm -hmm. So obviously we, we, we see this predominantly a lot from the mm -hmm. education point of view, with this kind of thing that's pushed, but it's very difficult. Yeah. It's coming and dropping, do something really. And that's very good impact to teach you about. No, no, and that's, that's why I think, um, so I was on the phone call yesterday about how we can, what, how can we, how can we make this a thing? Um, and rather than just do it as a joke, because a lot of the initiatives have been, because we've grown so quickly, for a long time there was only four or five labs down the country, and the initiatives they did were very local to them, but they had great impact in, on with their schools, but where, you know, how can we turn some of these training skills into an apprenticeship? Or other things. It, we're very much we've got lots of ideas of how we can make this a thing. Because we, have, like I said, we're growing. We want to make these things work for the corporates, for your SMEs, for your one man, one bands, for your yeah. educate. You know, we want to figure out what the long term thing. Because we're at that stage now where we have to think in those terms. We have to think how can we make impact at last. I'm slightly concerned about the kind of the idea that the knowledge comes out from here and then it's dropping back yeah. here and yes. I want you to... I was just about to ask who designs the content to drop into schools. Say so again, sorry. Who designs the content to drop into schools? I think a lot of it is, um, so for the stuff that the engineers do will be um, very much led by them. So whether it's a one week, uh, I'm trying to think of an example. Um, that, uh, there's one that, that Cambridge engineer did um, and I forgot, it was not no, Scout, something else. They basically they just developed a session that, um, because of their expertise, was um, electronics making, used to work for Acorn. Incredible like, wealth of expertise. They developed it themselves and would go in um, over a number of weeks and run sessions. I think the difficulty you have, and this is kind of the same, to this time and time again, is that companies are keen to go into schools and deliver content one way or the other, but this design process tends to be done without consultations to teachers in terms of lesson plans and learning outcomes and assessment and how it can fit to the curriculum. Mm. It usually ends up being a fun enrichment that gets dropped in and then left, even though that's a program of several kind of weeks. Yeah. The content isn't really designed with either teachers or students in mind with respect to the education system. It's done by people who have, as you say, technical expertise, but who are not part of teaching 21 week. There's mm. one of the constraints of it. And I think for any of the companies looking to do this, you should be approaching other ways 
Uh, another way is to provide resources for teachers to develop content themselves, get teachers on board, sit down and talk to them about what they need or what they demand. We, we do. And we'll train teachers in the content and develop it alongside them, rather than coming in with, here's another bunch of stuff, and we'll come and do it with some of your kids, not all the school. That's the other thing. Yeah. There's the, a few individuals. And that's the only way that companies such as yourself are actually going to make any real impact on education. It's also, that's a really valuable role that's mm. not currently being fulfilled. And that's, that's a whole lot of ed tech companies. That, if you have scale and you have the motivation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, that's, why our engineer, that's why our engineer, because we'll be honest with you, it's not, it's not just CSR, it's really some, the, what we're trying to lead with is being led by an ex head teacher mm -hmm. who, through random life change, mm -hmm. um, got into becoming a lab engineer for us and a maker. Um, and that's why she's been a lot of thinking on this, because she knows, I'm not sure how long she's education. 25, she's 55 now, I think. And you're right, we, and that's why the stuff she's been leading on and working with in pockets is to understand that journey. And it's not, it, it, you, I understand that they're coming from a, another giant corporate and similar things. Like, you're right, they can just come in, drop in, this looks great, tick a box, go. I think it's, um We've gone around into make spaces to kind of make this teaching other makers or teaching kids um, using what we would use and trying to make it as good as possible and not be not be off putting or not be incomprehensible to somebody who's ten years old. So um, engaging with the kind of national curriculum and trying to get a meme there that will actually go around teachers is incredibly hard when you've got all these entrenched companies who are kind of feeding off the school budget. Um, but yeah, I think I'll say kind of not so much, we're starting to try and engage with the curriculum and provide those resources. But it's kind of the best way to do that and create a meaning that will actually make some impact. So the things like the Raspberry Pi and the Microbit land correctly is something that's not going to die in with as a resource within months or just never make an impact at all. It's probably worth being explicit that the Raspberry Pi and the products around it also create a future market as well. So a future market that they do, they use use the purpose. Another issue that educators face is that most of the comments I mentioned have been here. They only do have a student, but a lot of the coding goes on. A lot of the, a lot of the physical computing that goes on with bars and microbits and the like in schools tends to be seen as ICT, it tends to be seen as coding on the screen, making games. It's very limited in the amount of schools actually building full stuff with it. And, and using pies and what we know as market bits and circuit playgrounds to build interesting things that will teach kids. I think that's another move that has to take place. Move off the screen. It's not all about code. Start making cool things and getting kids in the world. Absolutely. Developing all of those literacy around that, whether it's material yeah, or it's not. At the same time, fighting the fact that you've got old PCs, some got tablets, and trying to get used to that moving as the mainstream thing. Well, that fans. is an asset and promoting it to and getting out of there so that we could use that. And it's been a good base for us to, you know, places where we know we could get kit. The problem is, is now, it's not so much developing it again, we are getting out of there. The biggest problem now is that a lot of it is not pitched for the content curriculum, so why are we using it? Yeah, absolutely. Your arm's going to fall off. <coughs> it is, yeah. Sorry to drag this away from education, but it's something that I was wanting to ask Chris
each nation that uh, had pieces from academics and makers who submitted is in a different moment. So it's not an easy answer either. But yeah. like in the case of China, they're they're on like an upswell where the government really cares right now. Mm-hmm. I mean, even in the UK, I would say like this this um, libraries education making policy that's sort of trickling down in the UK government means we're starting to be in a, in a moment, right? Whereas places like Brazil, a lot of it is grassroots, bottom up, um, or top down, like uh, Telefonica type partnerships with massive corporations, uh, multi-million uh, international corporations. So I feel like there's there's so many confluences of actors um, circulating around the world, inspired by different moments, and then going into different places right now. But I, I don't see it changing anytime soon, just because there is so much circulation of makers mm-hmm. internationally, even this British Council, us going to China every few years thing that they're doing, it just shows that there is still, I guess, an appetite for that kind of global exchange, um, which gives me hope, because I hope that we can continue to learn from each other and hopefully build, um, maximize like our power as makers who believe that making should be seen a certain way, right? mm-hmm. that it should be democratic, that it, that it shouldn't be uh, run by those who have the most money and therefore perhaps the most power, but it should be run by those who understand what it should be for as well. Right? Yeah. I'm conscious that there was a question here a long while ago. Yeah, um, I'm probably thinking probably the different topic again. Are we in a cost from a desktop manufacturing point of view, a bit like we were with the uh, 3D printers and digital cameras? Sorry, um, in get printers and digital cameras were the photography a few years ago. Are we at that cost yet, or are we, are we close to the cost we were three D printers become a commodity item and more and more people are using them because I am come across friends and colleagues who are uh, introducing them into their homes now. Are we there yet? Could be because I think I bought my three D printer from Aldi. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, if we push back on that as well, so your example of the inkjet printer and the idea that everyone was going to print that for both photos at home, mm. look at that trajectory and look at where we are now. We don't mm. print our own photos at home. You go to somewhere that's got a really good one that doesn't break all the time, and then the ink doesn't like bleed and fade over time. We Maybe don't even print photos anymore. Yeah, I think it's. <laughs> I think it's. I think it's. I think it'll be. I don't think we're not wrong all the way, but I think it'll be a, a middle ground where. It just become more productive. I remember what was a TED talk years ago about uh, a three D printer every home. You're going to three D print your own pen, three D print. Your own. That's not going to happen because. But I think there'll be a middle ground. But we're using this technology middle ground. I think there will be not just people hobbying, not just people understanding. I think there will be genuine use, but not for everybody. Uh, I think the, the correlation to digital printers, inkjet printers, because inkjet cartridges were dry for people who didn't use them. The paper would dry out, people would buy a 3D printer and not know how to use it, it would break or couldn't get it to produce what we wanted to do. So there, there is a very similarity between the two. Absolutely, when you try and keep both. Yeah. Yeah. They, they start solving the printers by closing off the technology completely and making sure the consumables were tightly controlled and overpriced. Yeah. And Prusa have just released their extra quality filament, which is legitimate, but if it goes that way, Commoditized 3D printing will be, hey, if we lock everything down and make sure you can't break it and use the right stuff, then it might just work. Yeah. Yeah. And that might change, but we're not there yet. Yeah, absolutely. I, which, um, I forgot which patents were out, was that's when everything started becoming like all the knockoffs came online, didn't it? Because it was a certain, was it one patent or a number of patents that just kind of ran out? I oh, can't remember. Yeah, yeah, at least at a few stages. Yeah, at least at a few stages. Yeah, I think it'll be, yeah, there'll always be the, the, the ragtag made, handmade versions available. You're right, there'll always be, in any industry, but there'll always be that. Uber version, I don't mean Uber the car, but like the, the, super, <laughs> the super version that is always locked down by a big company. I'm going to go with Alex first because she is the boss. That's scary. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm conscious of time, but I also want to ask Kat whether um, your slide about this network, uh, this technology networks in the UK, which I have never heard about, whether that was also kind of a warning sign and whether you can talk about. Um, whether you see the connection between politics and, you know, these days it's whatever the ICT curriculum may or may not include, or, you know, what are the power dynamics that uh, people suffered from in those particular programs at that time that we can learn from um, while we're talking here today? Because it feels like we don't quite have that, but maybe we're on our way to having that again. 
know what we should uh, be careful of. Yeah, I mean, I really like using that example, and, and like, I'm so glad that Adrian uh, sort of unearthed it because I feel like most of us don't know about them, and like, I, I didn't before he was doing this research, and I mean, it, it is a sad fact of making and making communities that we all are, um, we well need funding, and in many cases there are these there are these historical moments where the government gives us that funding, but unfortunately, administrations don't stay in power for long, so. In the case of China, there's a bit more sustainability because it's just one party, but like, you know. <laughs> here, here we're going to And I think, I think that's why a lot of the submissions to that institutionalization topic came from the UK because that we are in a moment where we, like, making is becoming more and more uh, based on partnerships. So, like, in the British Museum, the, um, the Samsung Digital Discovery Center, as it's called, Longest name ever is in their basement, and they um, they do a bunch of different digital making courses. They're always full, and they get schools from all over the nation to come in, and they um, correlate the classes to the national curriculum. So they're, they're trying really intentionally to do a partnership with the British Museum that allows teachers to be in charge and educators, which I think is a very that's a sustainable model because it's really good for the museum. People are learning about the cultural collections in new ways. And it's really good for Samsung. It gives them good, good PR, right? So I think that kind of mixed model approach is perhaps the way forward, where, like you guys have said, where the, the actual community that, that is being accessed has control over what's happening, over the type of learning, over the outcomes, but also the companies or external parties who want to get involved are allowed to be partners, because if we just depend on, on political uh, outlets, then we, we usually will lose that funding before long. Well, unfortunately, I wish it wasn't that case. We have a question here. Can anybody else wave vigorously so I'm aware of you? Well, shall we go to the pub? That's the question I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and question B. Actually, I'm interested to hear from you, please, Anna. Oh, God. Um, <laughs> like, about sort of historical perspective, so if I am not the right person for that. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll open it to the panel then. Like the question I'm just curious about is if you look sort of in the last 50 years, and then you imagine that the maker movement came about in what the mid 90s ish something. You, you, this thing called the maker movement. I'm just sort of curious to hear. If you think that that was the response to something that happens in the, happened in the previous twenty years, or was it an evolution of something, or was it a mutation? Like, what? Why are we doing this? Well, you've got the whole genealogies. We both read the same sort of So you do know what you're talking about. I thought when you read history, I thought you read like proper history, which I just, you know, I'm a high school guy, so I don't know about that. Um, <laughs> what do you know about? Oh, no, don't ask me that. That's a different subject entirely. Um, in terms of the genealogies and the kind of background, the yeah, multiple it just kind of is. So you could decide that it was from the kind of communist bloc, the access to information, and they um, fall the oil in wool, and they unearthing a whole group of people who had access to a certain type of technology and a movement that evolved around it. So you can draw a route there. You can say that that started. Then you kind of growing 70s, 80s, 90s into hack bags, hack spaces. Or you can go with the kind of more US based model. If you want to pick up on that? Or right, well, I can go with the more kind of community innovation. Yeah, yeah no, I, I think you said it well. I, I think I have issues when people attribute the maker culture, and they'll usually say it's just one maker culture, to America. Because, in, as, as you guys know, like it, it was happening in many different countries in the world in different ways, perhaps some of them lo-fi, some of them more techy, before America took over, before Americans, not America, before certain Americans took over the term making for themselves and did a bunch of TED Talks that made it seem like they had started it. Um, so I, I do think that it, it's best described through many different points of entry rather than just one hegemonic one that and you know, his last name is Anderson, but you know, not naming names. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of each of those different groups have a different ethos approach. Yeah. Kind of behind that, I think that still affects how we work. That still affects some of the kind of hacking and making that I would align with. Some of the stuff that you make is probably based on a certain type of ethos and a certain way of 
thinking about the world, you might kind of decide your founding fathers are making. Uh, I think the internet had a lot to do with it. Because um, before the maker movement, I was, uh, I was into knitting. So Stitch and Bitch was the thing. Yeah. That, was, that was the maker movement for knitting. It went from everyone was knitting in their files or whatever, um, crafters in the US mm -hmm. saying, hey, now it's cool and releasing box of things. And it's Stitch and Bitch. Yeah. And, that yeah. was <laughs> and that was meeting up. And that was, that was kind of the maker movement for the knitting community. Yeah. Just coming out, communicating, saying, hey, we're all here. I'm not the only person in my town who knits. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, same with the maker movement that we're all there for, now it's just given identity and... Yeah, and that whole finding your people thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Your people might be different in different places, different backgrounds, different aims and endeavours. Well, the good brand name, you can smooth that out, right? Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, internet! <laughs> Adrian, I told you about half an hour ago, I was going to put you on the spot to do closing remarks with me, so that yes. it's not just me on my own. That's fine. So yeah, I think you should go mm -hmm. ahead now. <laughs> but we have the internet now, we can communicate across the <laughs> 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 What were you going to say? Uh, good question. I don't know. I think we should say thank you for coming. Yes, we should thank definitely do that. Conversations. Lots and lots of relevant questions. Yeah. So what do we know now? What, what do we do for the next 10 years? Like... <sighs> Take over the world? But why? Right. Why? Because why, why should we? Because we've got more of an interesting approach on things, and we are the you know mostly because we, we're all of a, of a type, aren't we? We're, we're more socially engaged, I think. Um, I think one thing that's interesting, actually, that I think we we need to do is we need more kind of success stories. Like at the moment, there's in the UK maker community, there's like Primaroni, mm -hmm. and not very many others who've done the kind of getting big, and I think. There are times, there's an article I read a while back about the um, difference between like rock music or kind of indie music and hip hop. Um, I'm going to some of this, so don't worry about it. Um, <laughs> and like the fact that indie has that kind of, because they're both sort of this sort of like on some level grassroots kind of people getting on and doing stuff, but then in indie there's a kind of culture of selling out. So like you can't be big because once you're big you've sold out and you're like we don't like you anymore. Whereas in hip hop they have a culture of blowing up, like where like the, the success and like this is great, like one of our people made it and that's awesome. And we need to have more of a blowing up culture than a in the like a like, selling out culture. I distinctly remember you doing a similar thing, talking about punk. Probably about two years ago. Yeah, well that's it. And punk has the same sort of like as it goes mainstream, like it becomes. Very yes. different thing, and, and I suppose some of it's just picking examples and finding other places where cultural movements have gone from being niche to being mainstream, and how the mainstream adopts them. And like, I'm always mindful of that. I suppose is why I'm asking Kat earlier about like our moment in the spotlight, because I'm like, you know, it might just be that, it might just shift, or it might become, or when I'm sort of saying to Emma that I want like a maker space next to every McDonald's, but not tomorrow. Because I think we'll just get a you yeah. know like the current culture, and I think I think we need but to change culture. Way, but that's me. The only way we're going to change that culture though is if we tell more stories that aren't the success stories. If we actually have the kind of authentic storytelling within our community, where we can actually learn from our experience. Yeah, like, uh, but on some level, we're supporting each other and and not being afraid of the success stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, definitely being able to kind of go, no, that was that was epic. Yeah. And that was impactful in these ways. And recognizing those different types of value and those different types of politics or anti-politics that are associated with those changing how and why we make things or Yeah. Well narrative is good and bad, isn't it? Narrative is not just good. Narrative is awesome. Um, that's why I believe what we're trying to do. Because it's good and yeah. That makes sense. And I think as long as there is an upward narrative, like I said, everyone gets on board with it. But yeah, uh, yeah. Sure That's quite a big ask. Oh, oh yeah, yeah, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But what struck me is that this needs to be a sort of um, carefulness about the make to like your way of scaling growth, the tech market, which is like the Google apps. There may be people on the ground in the city that are trying to do just what you're trying to do, but they don't call it that and they don't have the local m m might behind them, the local authority, the, the brands, etc. So, how do you know how to kind of Knit a weave, I guess. So when you're going into a place, I'm here today. Yeah. So that I mean, this is a great example of it. But I guess 
what I can see a local authority what they're doing, because I had this conversation with somebody who's got a railway shop this week, that are entity, going, the maker culture, maker movement, tell me about this. And I'm like, oh, wait, you're asking me. They would love a Barclays to come in and basically solve the problem down High Street, probably, in a different way. But there's loads of people who wouldn't have that visibility, who need that space, who may not be seen because they don't have the visibility. So how, how do you sort of work with the other people that might be competitive to your model to make sure you don't extinguish those grassroots? That makes sense. Yeah, not just Barclays, I'm yeah. picking on you because you're here, but those that can see this emerging space but it's also how you yeah. learn to garden as well. Yeah. So instead of just making a thing and scaling it in that way, quite predictable, mm -hmm. almost that love airdrop model, how yeah. do we learn to garden within our own ecosystems to make visible what is already there, to nurture and grow the skills that are in a region anyway, and to then enable different things to grow? Mm -hmm. Well, that's because I think we have to engage with the council we've had people as well. So, so there are examples, we've always done that, and because we're self-funded, we're quite independent, and we're quite proud, fiercely independent, um, but that then means that we can be, um, like we can, we, we meet the councillors as equals, almost, and at times that doesn't work, because there's like a mutual lack of respect, where the councillors are going, I'm a councillor, and I'm going, yeah, we're doing shit, <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't line up, yeah. But there are other times when it does, yeah. um, and it then means that when, um, uh, yeah, that I sat in a meeting with the Fab Labs people because they were angling for Liverpool to have a Fab Lab, um, and you know he told me that my model wasn't sustainable. Um, and I'm pretty sure that we're still here, and the only important Fab Lab isn't. Um, so I think at the moment I'm still ahead, but. This stuff's difficult, and it's like you know, you need to be able to be in those. That only happens from kind of building the conversation, like having those conversations, putting the legwork in beforehand to build the network, so that when the councils are going, oh, I've heard about this thing. Yeah. And sometimes it's like I get a phone call from somebody at the left going, like, some council's just been on to me because someone's gone, like, phoned up and gone, we need to have a fab lab in Liverpool because apparently three D printers and thick. And he was like, yeah, the printer does. They're in Central Town. And he's like, no, but there's a thing, and they're like, yeah, yeah, they're doing that, it's a central town. Like, you won't have heard of them, but, and you need to, like, you need to be able to work so that those, you know, yes. those connections get made. And at times they do, at times they don't. Um, but also it's about that, but. valuing different types of knowledges as well. So yeah. knowing that that local knowledge is fundamentally important to how you do things here, how things get made here, yeah. and being able to make it legible elsewhere so that when people come into a place, they can see things differently. And also valuing that kind of craft person knowledge and recognizing that that deep craft is something that, yes, you might be getting to an extent within maker spaces or within a maker community, but it's not something that only exists here. It exists everywhere. That kind of deep knowledge of education, that deep knowledge of how you make things with leather, how you process things, all of those deep knowledges we need to find ways of somehow bridging the gaps between. And the only way that we know at the moment, and I might be wrong, is by bringing people together in bar raising and so trying to do stuff together. Just a little bit is in the community, isn't it? Because so I reckon university, people still want to pay nine grand to do making degrees, even though they're very expensive and they are dying out. But what's to stop? And there's a lot of things you know, wrong with universities, to be honest. And I think that you know we're living in a society where we're getting more isolated because of tech, where I know people who teach and they don't even know each other in the same class, and they don't even meet anybody in clubs anymore. They're just so isolated. You know, people just online constantly. I know it's like an old person saying that. But I think what you do here is has got so much value and we just don't realise it right now and I think in 10 years with they like things like that, which are all really cool things, they're great, that's going to be more valuable and I just think it's a, a case of surviving until it's recognised and also other people trying to do this are like social subscribers, so GPs who are, you know, they're saying actually if you go to this allotment class, that's actually taking away hospital beds and they're trying to find values for things that aren't just economic values, but no one's buying it yet. 
And I think it's a case of it's growing, it's happening not just to make a movement, it's happening in health and social care movements as well. And they're looking at business models and they're trying to say, hang on a minute, this makes economic sense, just not in that way. And I just think it's going to take time and I just think it's really hard now, but I do think you'll get a stage in 10 years where it will be recognised. It's just really hard to get that message up to those people in councils and policies, isn't it? They're just, yeah, anyway. And also hard to be accountable to the ambition as well. So the kind of that emotional labour of knowing what you want to be able to achieve and want to be able to nurture and in, and also be honest to that and about when it's not possible or when it fucks up, when it doesn't work. Well, the hard part of that talking is how do you measure success? And um, so what is success and what is and keep the ask the question and then be able to measure that. Yeah. But then we get back to the kind of bootstrapping, don't we? Bootstrapping um, strategically, so the, where you're aiming for a lifetime business as opposed to a lifestyle business. Which again doesn't mess with the politicians because, you know, their cycle of life five or whatever it is, yeah. Um, on, on, on that question, the fact that we've got um, two people who've chosen to, to come to the uh, to Dad rather than going to university at the moment. I mean, they may change their mind later, but that's what they're doing now, so it's, uh, they seem to um, Is it Robert Clark? I think it's, yeah, we're, we're having applause for all of the speakers. <laughs>